Welcome everybody to another edition of Better Know a Birder. Uh, before we get started, a couple of administrative things. Everybody is on mute. Everyone who, who is uh, with us through Zoom is on mute. If you have a question for Mel, you can type that into the chat box. And if you are watching us through Facebook Live, you can type your comments, your questions into the comment box and those will be relayed to me to relay to Mel. So I'm delighted to be talking to uh, my friend Mel White, who is a Conway native who has worked as a newspaper and magazine writer and editor. Since 1990, he's been a freelance writer specializing in nature and travel writing, working mainly with publications of the National Geographic Society, like this one that I'm holding here, Guide to the National Parks by National Geographic. Hey, Dan. I'm happy to be here. Uh, and he began birding as a small boy and now has a life list of 2,835 species. Oh, now we lost your video. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Mel, uh, tell us how did you get started in bird watching? My uh, my mother was kind of a backyard birder. I have no idea what got her interested. I think she may have had some friends in Conway when I was growing up who were interested in birds and they may have gotten her interested. But all I know is that from the time I was, you know, a sentient human being, um, she was interested in the backyard birds. And we used to sometimes go driving around what was then rural Faulkner County uh, on Sunday afternoons and look for birds. Just a gradual development of a love for birds. For as yeah, long but I was pretty crazy about birds even when I was a young uh, boy. I mean, people used to kind of make fun of me because I thought about birds so much. <laughs> and you go off chasing rare birds, new birds around the state? And no, uh, that happened much later. Um, I, you know, like I said, she was just kind of a backyard bird watcher. And, um, you know, we didn't understand the concept of birding or traveling to bird or keeping a life list. Um, I don't know why it keeps turning off my video. Anyway, um, yeah. And then I kind of lost interest when I was a teenager and then it just all came back suddenly when I was in college. And so ever since college, I've been pretty serious about it. So um, you're, a, you're a travel writer. Uh, you sometimes get paid to travel around and look at birds. Where is... Uh, where was your favorite place that you've been to that you got paid to go to, to look at birds? Well, I always say uh, that Australia is my favorite place that I've been. I've been to some pretty cool places, but uh, I just think Australia is about as close as you can get to going to Mars and still be on this planet. I mean, everything is different in Australia. Plants, birds, uh, you know, I assume, I assume the fish are different. <laughs> But it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful world there. And luckily I've been there five times now. So I've wow. kind of gotten a little bit familiar with the, with the bird life and the wildlife there. That's on my uh, destination list for sure, but I just don't have the time to go over there at this yeah. point. That is one problem. You, you need at least two weeks, if not more, to really do justice to it. I say, I don't know why my video keeps going out. Let me see if I make you co-host. Maybe that'll keep your video going. All right. <clears throat> uh, so then besides getting paid to go birding, uh, to travel somewhere, where is the, where is your favorite spot that you've gotten to go to just on your own? You, for your own birding vacation? Um, well, we had a, we had a really good trip to Ecuador once. That was a, a really great place to go. Um, the place I have not been that I'd most like to go is someplace in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, maybe Thailand or Cambodia, Vietnam, probably not Vietnam. I, a friend of mine went to Vietnam and apparently you have to be on a tour group you can't just go off on your own in Vietnam. Whereas in Thailand, 
um, you know, that's, that's kind of really at the top of my list right now, places I'd like to go. Is Vietnam just not safe to go off on your own? I think it's more just the government control. You have to have a, a, an officially licensed guide with you all the time in Vietnam. Um, and you can certainly take birding tours. I mean, there's a guy, a guy who runs birding tours that, that I communicate with who seems like a really great guy. Um, but I just, it's more fun to me to go off on my own and, you know, do my own thing. Well, how much time do you take to prepare before you go on a trip to study the birds so you know what you're looking at when you get there, especially if you're going to be off on your own? Well, uh, yeah, if I were going to go to, to, uh, to Thailand, for instance, I'm sure I would spend many, many days in the weeks beforehand trying to get up to speed a little bit on the, uh, on the uh, birds that are there and what I might run into um, because they have families there that we don't even have here, you know, just like Australia, the, the bull bulls and the, you know, leaf, uh, leaf birds and these other kind of things. Um, uh, you know, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to, uh, get up to speed on what I might be able to see there. When I was doing stories for National Geographic, I mean, I spent many, many weeks studying, uh, get, taking notes before I would go on a trip. But that was not just for the birds, obviously, it was for the whole, you know, the background for the whole story. Well, um, so have you had any scary experiences in your travels? Any close calls or anything like that? You know, I, I really can't say, uh, I can't think of anything. There have been some tense situations, but I never, never, uh, never one where I was, you know, literally in fear of my life. I, you know, I was, uh, I told people this recently, I, I was in uh, Borneo and I was, I'd gone to a camp uh, there was five miles from the nearest town. And, and as it turned out, I, I walked back by myself. It wasn't scary. The trail was well marked. Um, and as I was, there was sun bears there and there were tigers and things, but I mean, I wasn't too worried about that. They're so rare. But on the way back, I was walking on this trail by myself and here comes a dog. And I, I was actually scared about that because, um, you know, what if the dog bit me, uh, out there, I would never be able to find the dog's owner and know whether it uh, had got rabies shots or anything. I'm sure it hadn't. Um, and so actually, wow. that was one of the scarier moments <laughs> of my life. But luckily, as soon as the dog saw me, he was more afraid of me. So he turned around and ran the other direction. <laughs> but I've flown around in little planes and helicopters a few times, which, um, yeah. you know, but there was never any bad weather or anything. So I, it's all, you know, I, I really can't complain about my trips. <laughs> National Geographic, uh, was really good to me for a long time. It sent me to some pretty cool places. Well, you also, you probably have experienced some tough conditions being out in the field. You, to, uh, to our Audubon chapter, you presented your trip to, uh, was it Papua New Guinea? Did yeah, New Guinea, that was, uh, yeah, that was uh, in the rainforest. Yeah, uh, and it was rain very, all very... the time, leeches falling from the tree. <laughs> Yeah, falling limbs were the most dangerous thing on that one because uh, it was the beginning of the rainy season. And so all those big tree limbs that were covered in moss and lichen and things were soaking up the rain and falling. Uh, and uh, I made sure my uh, tent was not under a big tree. <laughs> that was that was probably the, the most remote place. And, you know, I, one of the questions you said you might ask was, what's the rarest bird you've ever seen? And I guess it depends on how you define rare, but we went to these mountains where no human beings have ever lived in the history of the world. And um, not even the local people around there went up there because it was so rugged. Uh, and so these two scientific expeditions, I was on the second one, um, were up in these, and there's some endemic birds in these mountains. So like um, golden fronted bowerbird, I'm probably one of literally only about 30 people in the entire world who's ever seen this species because it's just in this remote area that no one ever goes and no one has ever gone. So you might say that's the rarest bird I've ever seen. <laughs> well, uh, a question from the audience is, what is a bird you have not seen that you most want to see? What's top Whoa. list? I can think of a few. Um, 
there's the three waddle bellbird in Costa Rica. Oh, that's high on my list too. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's a doable thing. You have to be at the right spot at the right time, but that's, that's a, do a bird that we can, you know, that anybody can see if you just work hard enough. Yeah. Um, when I was, um, I was in Madagascar to do a story t literally 20 years ago and I spent three weeks and there's a bird there called the helmet vanga, V-A-N-G-A. There's lots of vangas in Madagascar. Madagascar is, everything is endemic. It's like Australia. Um, and I miss seeing that. And I really, really wanted to see it. And then um, a, uh, a, a, a young woman I know uh, went there to work. Uh, he had a Watson Fellowship and she saw a whole bunch of them. So I told her she was, I was really jealous of her. So that's, that's a bird that I'd really like to see someday. But who knows if I'll ever, ever get back to Madagascar. I know those three waddle bell birds like to hang out way up, high up in the canopy, making them very hard to see, even though you can hear their plaintive bunks from a long ways away. Yeah. There's another bird in Australia that I've never seen, the buff-breasted paradise kingfisher. It's actually pretty common. I just had never been there at the right time um, in the right, right spot and right season. But um, that's another... That's another doable one that I hope to see someday. Uh, another question is, how did you end up uh, working for National Geographic? Oh boy, um, pure uh, luck. Uh, I, uh, I did a freelance assignment way back in the 80s uh, for a woman uh, and it was, it was, she needed it really done quickly and I did it very quickly and I guess she thought I did a good job. And then later when I approached National Geographic Traveler to try to get some freelance work for them, um, I gave her as a reference and it turned out unbeknownst to me, she had worked there uh, years before. And so she gave me this glowing reference <clears throat> and I started doing work for National Geographic Traveler <clears throat> And they just gave me more and more work. And then over the time I started doing work for the book division, I started doing work for National Geographic magazine, finally, um, in about 2003, maybe. Um, so um, that's how it all got started. And it just was, you know, there was a lot of luck involved and a lot of luck. <laughs> uh, so another question from the audience is if, Someone from another country were to ask you where to go birding in the U.S. and what the good birds are to see in the U.S., what would you tell them? Oh, I'm sure you have an opinion about that too, Dan. Um, <laughs> I would say, obviously, I think the choices are either Southern Florida or the Texas Gulf Coast and the Rio Grande Valley or Southeastern Arizona. Those would be my uh, three choices. And I actually wrote about this one time. I used to write a column for Living Bird, the Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology, uh, magazine and I actually wrote about this one time and I decided for that story that I would choose southeastern Arizona. Um, I think it's beautiful and you've got desert and you've got the high Chiricahua Mountains and you've got you know in, riparian habitat um, so I, you know that would be my choice but other people might chose, choose the Rio Grande <laughs> Valley or the Everglades. Right but the interesting thing is aren't those three places you mentioned southern Florida, southern Texas, southern Arizona they're special in part because they also have avifauna from outside the United States. Right, right. So right. they're not, not necessarily emblematic of the U.S. I'll tell you a place that I think is really underrated. I'll try to make this really quick. But I, I, a vacation to western Minnesota and North Dakota and South Dakota is, a, to me, a great birding trip. And it's a U.S. trip. It's very rural. You don't have to worry about traffic or anything. You can stay in cheap motels or camp if you want to. And there's a lot of great birds, northwestern Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. You can make a great trip out of that. And I've recommended it to many people. I would second that because I've spent some summers studying birds in western Minnesota and eastern North Dakota and explored both of those states. And they are beautiful and have yeah. a lot of birds. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people would argue that California, you know, deserve, and I haven't spent that much time birding in California, but it certainly has incredible varied habitats. Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that you are also the author of the American Birding Association's Bird Finding Guide to Arkansas, which is uh, 
was published a long time ago and is long out of print, but the American Birding Association has, I believe, started up a new series of bird finding guides. Oh, I didn't know that. I think so. Like, yeah. yeah. Would you, if they approached you, would you want to write an update to that guide? You know, we talked about that at one time. There's so much online now that you wonder, but then a lot of people said uh, that they still like having a physical hard copy of a book in the car with them when they drive around. And we talked about that. I don't know if you, it may have been before you even moved to Arkansas, I don't know. But I, I really wouldn't want to do it myself, you know, the whole thing. But I told people I would kind of be the coordinator if other people would write different chapters. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I wouldn't rule it out. That was 1995. Uh, when we did that, <laughs> that's how long ago it was. And uh, that's, uh, to reward myself for finishing that book, I bought uh, myself a pair of Leica uh, binoculars, which at the time were, you know, probably my, one, of the mo one of the best binoculars in the world. And I've had them ever since, what is that, tw 25 years? That I, and they're still great binoculars. Uh, I use them all the time. Wow. Well, I, mean, I agree that we have a lot more access to the internet now and eBird tells you where to find certain birds, but there's still, there's nothing like having local experience, like being able to either talk to somebody or read their book to say, here's where you should go and when you should go and how to navigate and go down this road and then up that road. And when you get right. stuck on airport, be sure to do this, this, and this, rather than just having a dot on the map and hopefully you find the bird. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's, and there's so many people now, you know, with, with uh, chat groups and things who, who have, would be able to contribute so much. So, you know, I, if it was a, something that would make money, you know, for conservation or something, I, I wouldn't argue against it. Um, it, was, it was kind of fun to do. Uh, it was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Viewer asks if you would consider yourself more of a birder or a writer. Or what now? Would you, are you more of a birder or more of a writer? Um, well, hmm. it's almost like two sides of a personality, right? I mean, <laughs> they're sort of, so they're so intertwined. I was telling somebody today um, who was, I was telling somebody that all that my whole, you know, so-called career, all these years of, of being able to travel and write, they all come from the fact that I was a bird watcher as a kid because bird watching got me into nature. And after a while, you, if you want to be a bird watcher, you have to learn about habitats. You have to learn about what's here and why is it here and not there. And if you, you want to travel to, if you want to see a uh, elegant trogan, you have to go to Southeast Arizona, right? So you have to travel. And so it's, they're just so in, they're so intertwined in my, in me that I really almost find it hard to separate them. Um, I've spent so much of my life going places and writing about birds that it's all the same thing to me. And I can't imagine traveling. I mean, I guess when my wife and I went to Paris a few years ago, I didn't really do a lot of bird watching, but <laughs> actually I did. We took some binoculars and walked through the Bois de Boulogne and some other places looking for birds. So it's almost impossible for me to go somewhere and not look at birds. Sure. Well, that's one of the beautiful things about birding is that you can do it anywhere you go. Yeah. Yeah. There's always a park somewhere across yeah. the street from the hotel in, you know, Madison, Wisconsin or someplace. <laughs> <laughs> well, what have you written about other than birds? Well, um, a lot of the travel writing I do uh, is not, some of it is, most of it is involves nature because I just got that reputation early on as, a, as a, somebody who wrote about nature. Um, and I used to joke at, at the Traveler magazine, I did something like 50 stories for National Geographic Traveler over the time. And there was a big joke uh, among them that I would always manage to get birds in every story that I wrote. Um, I mean, it wasn't, they weren't making fun of me, but the, well, they sort of, they were, but they, no matter <laughs> what story they gave me, I would somehow manage to get in birds. Um, but I did some just straight travel stories over time. I mean, I, they sent me to the Swiss Alps, uh, you know, and that was not really a bird oriented nature story. And they sent me to, uh, where else have I been? Oh, Italy, Northern Italy, the Lake country of Italy. Now both those trips, I did a heck of a lot of birding on my own. You know, when that, when I was off duty, I'd head down to the nearest park or something. But, um, and then of course, you know, in the past few years, I've done so much about the national parks. I mean, the National Geographic um, book division, which I've worked for many, many, many years, 
has, just puts out lots of guidebooks and, um, and I've written, yeah, that's one of them. And I'm working on, is that the ninth, eighth edition or the eighth? That's the eighth edition, I think. It says fourth edition. Oh, fourth. Okay. Well, the, the, the one that's out right now is the eighth and I'm working on the ninth right now, which is, will come out in a few months. Oh, so don't bother buying the eighth edition. It's already. <laughs> well, who knows with, with what's going on in the world, what's, how long it'll be, but we, I have finished my part in it 99%. Um, and it, it is supposed to be, be published sometime pretty soon, the ninth edition. That's the, probably the most popular guidebook they've ever done. Um, it just sold millions of copies. You know? Wow. So that's, that's kind of been my thing in the past few years. A lot of it's been working, uh, writing about the national parks. So you are a travel writer, but one of our viewers wants to know <laughs> uh, if you have any tips or advice for backyard bird watchers and people who are sticking close to home right now. Well, one thing I tell people, I'm on a video went away again. One thing I tell people is um, I think now a lot of the viewers here are bird oriented people and obviously you and Sam are, and you know what's, you know, what's how important backyard habitat is, but most people don't realize how many birds you can see just in a suburb like where you and I live. I mean, we, we saw a um, Kentucky warbler a few days ago in our backyard. Wow. Just out of the blue popped up 114 species we've seen in our backyard here in the middle of Little Rock. Now, some of them were flying over, right? They didn't, weren't, we didn't see a peregrine falcon perched in our backyard, but you know, flying over our house or perched in the trees around our house, 114 species. Um, oh, wow. yeah. And so, but we're lucky in that we have a little patch of woods behind us um, where foxes live and great horns owls have nested and things. But, um, you know, just do some research on the best way to um, set up bird feed feeders. You know, don't feed, uh, you know, rats and squirrels and things. Um, figure out ways you can just feed the birds. Um, and then leave shrubs and native, you know, shrubs and hedges and wild places in your yard. And um, you'd be surprised how much, uh, how much you can see just in your yard or the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, well, one of, the, uh, one of the benefits of having to work from home right now is that I get to see my feeders a heck of a lot more than usual. So when that red-headed woodpecker and rose-breasted grosbeak came by yesterday, Samantha and I were there to see those birds that we would have otherwise missed. Great, red-headed woodpecker, that's a good one. We've seen that about four times in the last 10 years in our, at our backyard, um, but it's not regular at all. Right, same for me, it's just second or third time for our yard. Yeah, they, they actually nest, they have nested north of us um, in some woods near Hall High School um, and then the really sad thing was that one day Hope was driving along Evergreen and saw one that had been killed um, in the road. It was very sad, but they, they tend to feed on the ground a lot and fly low to the ground. So I think they get hit by cars a lot. One so, thing I would tell people, now you mentioned eBird and I hope people participate in eBird, but if, you, if you're looking for a program to keep up with what you've seen, uh, there's this free program called Scythe Bill. I don't know if you, if you use it or not. Um, but it's absolutely free and you can help you keep up with birds you've seen. You can go back and check what birds have I seen in Texas, what birds have I seen in my backyard. Um, and it's really free and it, uh, it's a little complicated to use. It's not the most user friendly program, but if, if people are interested, it's S-C-Y-T-H-E-B-I-L-L, -S -S -E Bill. And if you just go to Google, Google Scythe Bill birding software, you can find the free download. So I'm just a plug for this guy that I have no idea who he is, but he does a good <laughs> job. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been asking my other guests uh, what advice they have for a beginning birder, but for you as the world traveler, what advice would you have for birders who want to travel outside the U.S. but have never been before? Um, well, A, don't be intimidated and, and take the plunge. Um, there are places that are easier than others. Um, you, uh, have you been to Belize, Dan? I forget. Yeah, for my honeymoon. Oh, we didn't, didn't we get, worked, didn't we go together on a cruise? No. no, not to no. Belize. We went to Costa Rica. I no, think. I haven't been to Costa Rica yet. So oh, okay. Belize. Well, one thing I would say is, is find a, a birding, uh, find a lodge uh, that maybe you can arrange transportation for you. 
and cut out as much of the logistics as you have as you can and just have fun with the birds. There are many lodges in Belize and Costa Rica and other places that will literally pick you up at the airport, take you to the lodge, feed you three meals a day. You'll see great birds and, um, and you won't have to really worry too much. And that'll get your feet wet in a foreign country. Um, and then you'll have maybe, you know, the courage to try something else on your own um, a little later. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there, you know, it's pretty easy to get around Costa Rica if you rent a car. Um, uh, I'm not so sure about uh, uh, Belize. Uh, it's a little, well, actually, it, it's not that bad the last time I went. Um, but of course, you can always go some really friendly place like England or, uh, and I love Spain. I've been to Spain seven times and they have fantastic birds there. And now it helps know a little Spanish, but the roads are great. You can get good directions. There's plenty of places to stay. I would hardly recommend someone who's never been to Europe to go to southwestern Spain. Does that answer a question good enough? I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take the plunge and go someplace where they, the logistics make it easier on well, you. First the first time, time, cut out as much of the worry. Don't, if you don't want to worry about renting a car, you want to worry about the language, then just go to a birding lodge and stay there a week and have a great time and come home. And then next time you can try someplace a little farther off the beaten path. Yeah. And going with bird tour companies can be expensive, but also is really nice to have all the logistics yes. for you and to have experienced guides to point out the birds. I do. Yes. Sure enjoy yes, that experience. yes. I've been, I've been on some of those and it's just, a, the only bad thing to me is, when you're seeing literally like 70 life birds in a day that tend to all kind of run together. <laughs> it's a little more fun when you, it is a little more fun when you find them on your own. Um, <laughs> you know, you remember, I, I remember birds better when I found them on my own than when some guy is going, oh, there's a this, there's a this, there's a this, you know. But it's also fun to have somebody take care of it for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many countries have you birded in? Well, I would say some 30 something. I mean, I've, if you count even brief visits, I've been to 41 countries, I think. And so I've birded in most of them, even if it was only for a short time. Um, the countries I've been to most are uh, Costa Rica, um, Spain. Um, and because of stories I've done, uh, Indonesia. I've been to in Indonesia a lot. I spent a lot of time in Indonesia. Um, just doing stories for National Geographic um, and had some great times there. Fantastic birds, obviously. Um, the place I might never have gone if it weren't for work. You know. um, the, one of the questions that um, people ask is the most memorable bird sighting. And I can do it really quick, I hope here. But in, there's, there's a bird in, in the old world, Europe and uh, Africa called the uh, Lammergeier. Uh, also vulture. called the bearded vulture, yeah, huge uh, vulture, lives in remote places, lives in the Pyrenees. It's been wiped out across a lot of uh, of its original range, but it's still in the Pyrenees and um, Africa and Asia. And in '97, uh, I got an assignment to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And um, once you get above a certain level in Kilimanjaro, um, there's hardly any birds because there's no there's no it's just rock. And so I was up about 15,000 feet and, um, and I had walked away from the campsite and just lay down on this big rock near some cliffs. And um, it was a beautiful day, bright sunny day, kind of cold, but, and I'm just looking up at the sky and here comes this enormous bird toward me over the cliffs and I could see it all the way down coming toward me. And it was, it was a Lammergeier, the only one I've ever seen in my life. And it came down and just soared, didn't move a muscle, just soared right past me. It was so close that I could literally hear the wind and its feathers as it went by, I hear the wind rustling the feathers as it zoomed wow. on. And it was one of those things where you can't even think you're so, it was a, such an amazing experience. And I guess, if I had to pick the most amazing bird experience of my life, that would be it. To see this one and only Lammergeier I've ever seen on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro and see it that closely. I could see the beard. I could hear the wind in its feathers. That was, that was truly an amazing, cool. you know, wow. you, that was truly an amazing sighting um, for me. 
So we talked a lot about birds and, and travel and writing, but I know you have some other hobbies. What other hobbies do you have? Well, um, music has been a big, big part of my life. Ever since I, in the 10th grade, the band director came to class and said, who wants to be in the band? And I raised my hand. That was one of the moments that changed my life. Um, the band, just the regular school band was really important to me when I was uh, a kid growing up. And then um, I got involved in a rock and roll band in college, a trumpet player quit and they asked me to come and join. And I've had really, really great times uh, playing in a band um, in college. And then we sort of transitioned into a, into a country club, uh, uh, you know, dance wedding band after that. But uh, <laughs> have played, have had some great experiences, enjoyed uh, working with some really, really uh, great musicians and having a lot of fun doing that. We're probably- you play? I'm sorry? What do you play? I played trumpet for a really long time. Um, and I still play trumpet some, but I kind of switched to keyboard uh, maybe 10 years ago. And so I mostly play keyboard and then I step away and play trumpet on some songs. And um, playing trumpet is more fun in some ways. <laughs> Cause you're up in the front of the band and you can watch people dance, but. Anyway. <laughs> uh, well, Mel, it's been a delight talking with you. You are, you're a lucky birder getting to travel to so many countries for business and pleasure and see a lot of different species. Uh, so thank you for Thanks, taking. I appreciate it. And we all appreciate what uh, people like you and Sam do for conservation in Arkansas. Uh, this is just one example of trying to reach out to people and we appreciate um, what you're doing. Well, thank you everyone for tuning into this edition of Better Know a Birder and uh, I'll be scheduling more of these in the weeks to come. So, ta-ta for now. Good Adios, folks.